Hi, I'm Alex Howards, and welcome to Secrets to Recovery Live. My guest in the studio today is Claire Jones, and many of you would have seen from our newsletter and Facebook that Claire is a concert harpist and also the former royal harpist, and we'll talk a little bit about that in today's interview, but has had a particularly fascinating journey in terms of her own experience with ME chronic fatigue and also recovery. And I think many of you watching this are obviously patients or hopefully prospective patients of the Optum Health Clinic. And you probably have a bit of a sense of that pushing pattern, that achiever pattern. And I think part of what's going to be fascinating about is seeing someone get to the point that they're really achieving all the things that they have dreamed of and then health falling apart and potentially getting in the way of that. But then also coming through and what that looks like on the other side with recovery. So there's lots of things that will come into today. But firstly, Claire, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. And also thank you for your kind of more general kind of support in terms of what we're doing. I should say that you've got a new album that comes out on Sunday, right. I believe it is. Mm -hmm. And there's a concert happening in a couple of weeks or so, which I know you guys are donating some proceeds to the charity, which we really appreciate. So thank you for that. Oh, absolute um, pleasure. But there's a lot we could talk about here, and I think maybe the starting point is, when did you first get symptoms or get a sign that something wasn't right? You, you were saying just off camera that at 16 you had shingles. That's perhaps a kind of start point. I think if I look back at the history of even going from the childhood era really into teens, um, I was the type of person that would pretty much everything I could. Um, music was a huge, huge part of my life. Uh, I played piano, violin and harp, did all wow. my grade eights and got my distinctions on those when I was 13. Oh my I God. would end up <laughs> kind of... You, you know, really were an achiever from a young I age. I was, <laughs> extremely. I came from a household that was very hard working, extremely supportive parents, fantastic at bringing in the country in Pembrokeshire. Um, so I couldn't have asked for better really in that sense. And um, when it came down to though my passion, music, was it from a very, very early age. And so I think I got consumed by it, and I realised that obviously I had a had a you know some sort of talent anyway sure. at, at that point people were telling me well your gift is obviously music and my confidence nurtured along the way and I at the age of 14 decided that was exactly what I wanted to be I wanted to be a soloist I thought at the time it was going to be violin but um, but I carried on and at the age of 16 um, by that time I was doing pretty much a bit of everything I was in orchestras I was accompanying on the piano choirs in Wales it's very very traditional in sure, Wales to do sure. that um, and the harp I was competing and then juggling all of that with schoolwork so, of course, as you can imagine, yeah. it was quite heavy. So after every school day, there was concerts or rehearsals, yep. and then there was homework. I'd, and, yeah. I'd be up at six in the morning practicing wow. for a couple of hours before going to school. Wow. Um, but, you know, I managed to juggle it all, and I managed to do well in my A-levels and different things. But there came a point in that time when I was in the sixth form, 16, 17 years of age, and the crack started to show at that point, I, I think, because I did have shingles, and I was off then for about six weeks off school. Mm -hmm missing everything. And what, um, what was that like at that point? I mean, being super busy the whole time and then just, was that okay? or was just Yeah, I think at the time, and you know, when you're young, you, you kind of think, well, this is kind of normal, really. I mean, it's, <laughs> I've never really known any different, yeah. really, to be honest. And uh, you, you sort of just go by what you know, really, yeah, and what you've seen sure. and what you do. So at the point, I knew I was busy, but I just thought it was quite normal. Yeah. So that time was taken off, but um, I never had any idea at that point anything else might resurface sure. later on in my life. So when it came to it, I got back to full health and I carried on and I auditioned for music college, went to the Royal College of Music in London. Then I went to the Royal Academy of Music to do my master's. And um, in that first year of college, I decided actually I was going to change because I auditioned on violin to get into college. So as you can, can imagine, physically playing the violin is quite awkward, really. You know, you're yeah. kind of bending over, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, physically. It's a quite a challenging instrument. Um, repetitive strains as well yes. on the body. And then I changed, actually, to the harp because my teacher suggested maybe I should because everybody was asking me to play the harp. Um, of, of course, there aren't as many harpists as sure, violinists sure. in the college. So I then began to sort of really place my dream, really, in, in my mind. I think that's when it happened, the second year of college, 19 years of age. So 
the point came where the Prince of Wales um, has a for youngsters, uh, young harpists, basically. And uh, it's there to nurture talent and to give somebody a springboard. Mm -hmm. And so the position came about and there was a vacancy coming up um, in the last year of my college year in mm -hmm. London. Um, so I decided that was my dream, really. Yeah. That was really my biggest goal in life, really. Sure. I wanted to really achieve that. And very fortunately, so I switched 19 and I uh, managed to get the position with the Prince of Wales. And wow. so I when, when, when you were how old? I was then 22, wow. 21, 22 uh, at that point. And I was just about to go to do my master's in the academy at the same time for two years. So uh, it was quite a busy time in life because I, I, you know, obviously the dream was there. My, my achiever patterns were running at an all time high. Um, my perfectionist traits were really kicking in. Yeah. Um, and so, but it was amazing because I, I just really wanted to go for this. And uh, I managed to do like an audition for a panel, first of all, at Clarence House um, of quite high powered people. Sure. And then I had to do a private audition for the Prince of Wales where he stood literally right there in front of the pillar of the harp uh, whilst I was playing, you know. So, no pressure, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> pretty intimate okay. experience. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, a really memorable one. Uh, but my life just changed dramatically. Yes. Like, all of a sudden, there was profile people wanting me to play, wanted to know why I'd been appointed. Yes. I was playing this magnificent gold harp of his that he has in Clarence House. I got to play over 180 times for the royal family, wow, all in all. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. And some of those occasions were one to one for the Queen. So the Queen would come in, she'd sit where you are there. I'd sit with my harp and I'd perform for her and do a short program. Wow. Um, I played at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff for 75,000 people for the Welsh rugby team. I, you know, did all sorts I of things. I won't ask which one you enjoyed the most. <laughs> oh, well, you know. <laughs> Indeed. Um, and also, I arranged some very big events for the Prince of Wales. I'd also have to sort of you know, present in front of the Prince of Wales as well in dinners where he'd hand over to me after his charity dinners and he'd ask me to entertain his guests for 20 minutes or so. I'd present a programme. Um, so they're quite high-pressured kind of times that at, the, at that point felt quite normal. I was really. going to say, were there signs of symptoms or you were just riding the wave of your dream I guess I was at the point riding the wave um, yeah. I was going from one thing to another and I was feeling that my dreams were all coming true yes. and I felt this is my time I'm invincible I and nothing will touch me I'll yeah. be fine you know and you sort of feel the world's your oyster really sure. and it was for a short time um, start to then get a few cracks which appeared um, probably around the age of 23, 24, where I started to get periods of fatigue. And at the time, I thought the fatigue was quite normal, maybe. I just thought, well, I'm bound to be tired mm. after things, but I should be able to cope with it. I'll just carry on. You and know, I, guess, I, and I guess whereas if you hadn't had the achiever pattern, you may mm. have gone, wow, I'm really, that's really interesting. My body's tired. But if you have an achiever pattern, it's, I guess that was that seen as a weakness, or it was you were just fixated on what on what what you were doing. I guess to be completely honest, I think I saw that as being something I wanted to brush aside. Yes. I didn't want to listen. Yes. I, my mind was so set on what I wanted to do and ha how much I wanted to achieve within this time. Mm. I had the the royal post, and um, and it's nothing. You know, of course, it's nothing personal to do with the post. It just happened to no, be. No, it understand. was something that gave me a chance to sure. do things, and. And, so it was, and it was your dream, and you were passionate yeah, about it. I absolutely, yeah. and you sort of want to make the most of it, really, sure. when, when, you're, when you're doing it. Um, so there were those times as well. Um, so there, there was one or two occasions where I had small burnouts, where possibly I'd have to take maybe a week or two off um, and just rest. Mm -hmm. and then, But immediately, of course, there'd be something else that I'd booked in, a project yes. or a performance where I couldn't miss, or I felt I couldn't miss. I understand. And so I had to go back on stage you know, not really fully recovered or, or feeling recuperated, yes. really. So during that time, it was a, a really funny sort of balance, really, because I was getting these little signs, but also there was so much happening, which was, you know, really keeping me on such a high, really. And the adrenaline, obviously, was pumping. Yeah, sure. So, um, and so what, what was the point where it became clear that it was more than just something that you could brush aside in a sense? Well, it slowly increased. I finished the position with the Prince of Wales and then I 
fortunately got to play at the Royal Wedding for Prince William and Catherine Middleton. And that was a point where there was so much going on press-wise. I appeared on over a thousand TV and radio networks worldwide. Oh um, wow. One of those networks, for example, ABC America, that's 500 million people, where I had to do interviews and Incredible. perform live and things. So they're quite high pressured, but I took it all in my stride. Yes. Um, but then there came the record deal with Classic FM, Go With uh -huh. The Golden Harp, which got to number three in the charts. I got married to my husband, Chris. Um, so this all happened within you know, a very short period of about two or three years. Yes. And that was the point where the symptoms were really starting to mm -hmm. gather. I was getting lots of headaches, which I thought, again, were quite normal, mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. um, digestive problems started to occur, but I didn't really pay it much attention. Um, and then came the pain. Okay. <laughs> the, that yes, as a harpist, it's something you can't yeah, ignore in the same way. That know. was the biggest point where I started to really pay attention really yes. was when the pain started to come on because the pain was throughout the whole of my body I mean every inch pretty much and my muscles just were so sore and they were burning and I'd get shooting pains and, yes. and different sort of things and I just had no clue what was going on and you know. it sounds like a, a disproportionate pain to anything you were doing and not just a kind of repetitive strain but a just muscular pain that was this is it. Unexplained, yeah. in a sense. But that was also another little thing, because I, obviously, as you said before, it's a physical instrument. You know, I'm yes. holding my arms up and my shoulders up like this. I, I, d I was doing five hours a day at college when I was practicing. Uh -huh. So my body had been through a lot, really, yes. throughout those years. And possibly I hadn't done enough to maybe counteract what was mm -hmm. going on, mm -hmm. the strains mm -hmm. I was having. Um, so I sort of thought, oh, it's probably down to the playing. You know, that's what's going on. Uh, but it got just worse and worse and worse. And I came back from a tour in America, because I was touring a lot in Brazil and America and Hong Kong and different places. I was doing silly things. I, I, I was getting on a plane one day to Hong Kong. I was doing the concert the next day, stepping off the plane, doing the concert, and then stepping back on the plane straight after doing the concert, wow. coming back to the UK, and then doing another performance in the UK. I was squeezing <laughs> things in, you yeah. know, just, just yeah. because I couldn't say no, because I thought this was a time that it was all happening for me, you know. Uh, and you felt invincible. I, yeah. I, I understand. I think a lot of people watching this will understand that feeling where you just feel like you're superhuman. Yeah, and, you, you and, do. and you don't want to see or hear anything that contradicts that because no. then it would start to challenge the whole structure. In yeah, a sense. and I, I think I thought, you know, to be sort of at the top of my game, really. I, I wanted to give it everything I could mm. and, and to be successful and to, to you know, to, to hopefully live a comfortable way of mm. life. I thought I needed to input as many hours, not just practice, sure. but like, it's, it's not just the playing when it comes to conducting a career in music. You know, it's all about the team you've got around you, your management, yeah. your PR, your PA, or whoever they are, you know, you've got, you've got to be steering the ship, really. Totally, so it's I a business. It. So it's kind of, it's hard to step away from it because it's a big part of your identity, really. And, and I guess also, uh, not that I'm saying something in your situation, but if you'd been in a situation where you didn't have the right people around you, also their livelihoods dependent upon yes. putting pressure. And you can have very good people putting a lot of pressure on someone because that's, you know, their own, and I know many people, again, watching this, been in situations they don't want to let people down no and that's oh. you know we talk about the achiever side but there's also yeah. that kind of helper side of wanting to take care of everyone else's needs and your absolutely. needs not getting a real look in absolutely and i'm glad you said about you know not letting people down because the worst point happened in the illness in well i know the date may 22nd 2013 where basically it had climaxed so much i couldn't control the pain with any painkillers in the pharmacy that you would get. Mm -hmm. I'd phoned various doctors um, and I just really didn't get much sense, really, to be honest. I couldn't even see anyone. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, and I, I completely understand the NHS are completely overwhelmed with mm -hmm. the amount of people, especially in London, that, sure. that you see, sure. you know. Um, and I suppose they might have thought I was on the young side, so I'd probably get over it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but when it came to it, Chris, my husband, had to take me into hospital in the end. And when I went into A&E, I had a seizure, and um, that's the point where everything changed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the doctors paid a lot of attention to what was going on. They ran all these different tests. Not yes. that they found much, but they tried to, to run different things. And sort of in a way, fortunately, the consultant that signed me off and mentioned the words, well, I, it's chronic fatigue, he mm -hmm. said to me at the end of my time at the hospital. Um, he then steered us in the direction of thinking, oh, well, that's possibly what it is.
That's what's happened. Yes. So, and what, how, did the, how was that for you to hear that at that point? I think I was so out of it, it didn't really sink in because yes. I was in so much pain. They put me on a lot of painkillers and just basically all I could do was sleep pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, the heartbreaking thing was really for my family because I sort of felt very much for them because obviously Chris had seen it all happen and that mm -hmm. obviously scared him so much. Sure. Um, and to see somebody who's close to you, you know, he keeps saying, you know, you were so on cloud nine every moment of the day and, you know, you were living such an amazing life and different things were happening and then boom, yeah. it just, you know, it just went, you know, yeah, <laughs> everything. And, and, and of course, I know with hindsight, you guys can see that the different warning signs, but yeah. when you don't know what to look for no. and you're just focused on what you're doing, it's like, it's, it, there's almost an inevitability to, to, mm. to what happens. But there so you, that a diagnosis and initially you were just kind of, kind of someone out of it, as you started to kind of let the diagnosis sink in somewhat, yeah. Uh, what, what was that like? And did, did you have it did you have to cancel concerts or? Yeah, that was a bit I was coming on to about letting people down, right, you know, because yeah. my my biggest trait is, you know, I would always put everybody else before me, right. and that's the type of person I am. I, I'm I, I'm very creative in the way I am, but also I I love to to see smiles on faces. Right. I love to perform and see their eyes and see how they react and and the buzz it gives people. And I love to give basically, mm. and that's what I do as a performer: is give constant on stage and they get to a point where you can't give any more you know you, you have to be nourishing yourself right, and sure. giving your body even more you know TLC really to kind of be able to give more again sure. and so when the point came um, my mum and dad and, and Chris decided I needed to move back from our home in London back to Pembrokeshire in Wales to live with them for a mm -hmm. few months. And not, we didn't know that at the time it was going to be a few months, but sure. it ended up being three or four months. Um, and Chris, because we needed, obviously, f for money to keep coming sure, in, he I needed understand. to keep working. Yeah. So yeah. he was back and forth from London every weekend. And so um, because I needed care, I needed full-time care, I just needed somebody there to, to get me out of bed, to, to be able to just make food for me, try and help me to eat. Even, you know, bathing myself was a challenge, mm. you know, to, as you know, it, sure. it gets to that point, you know, and, where... And I'm wondering what that was like, having gone from being superwoman, in a sense, mm. to having to be like a child, in a sense, taken care of by your parents. I mean, yeah. and I know a lot of people really struggle with going from being so independent, almost kind of ultra independent, mm. to actually having no choice, but to let others take care. And yeah, I, I, I think it was psychologically very, very difficult mm. to sort of move from that state to then having to, it was almost like going back to being a child again, yeah. but gosh, was I so thankful they were there to look after sure, me because, I get it. you know, and Chris did obviously as well, sure. but there's certain pressures as there are, aren't there, to sort no, of... No, of <laughs> no, I get it. <laughs> yeah, you do. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, and when it came to the point of having to cancel the concerts, yes. that I had to cancel stuff in Moscow, Abu Dhabi, in Britain. Um, having to tell people and overhear the conversations on the phone between my family and voters or mm -hmm. and the fixes, and them trying to explain, because obviously at the time you weren't 100% sure, you know, that's what the consultant had said, but sure. you know, you don't want to say that out loud yet because you're not. You, you know, don't you, want to you sort of want it's true to, in a sense. Yeah. Well, exactly. And, you know, so it was trying to explain that I'd gone through something and I couldn't really perform. And so I had to just have the rest. And I think it took a while for my brain to realize actually, I need to slow down and give my body some time to just rest. Because my mind was constantly in the cycle of, okay, so what's the next goal? What's the next thing? Okay, mm -hmm. we're on to that next. And I'm planning 10 years ahead all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And, I'm not even there yet. <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then again, you're totally overwhelmed by the pressure and everything that comes with that. Precisely. And yeah. my body just could not keep up with yeah. that sort of pace of life. And why should it have to? Sure. I mean, like, you know, so I needed to break that cycle of, you know, constantly the communication between mind and body, yes. really, um, as the clinic cleverly sure. teaches us about, you know. W so um, Was there a point of, of relief that came in at any point? Or was it just a kind of sense of I've got this new challenge that I, that I have to face? I mean, I when you kind of accepted that you, yeah. you couldn't keep going. I, yeah, I completely, yeah. The, the minute you said that now, yeah. The first moment um, I remember feeling a little bit of relief was, I think, a couple of weeks in where I was at my parents and I sort of thought, okay, I can just actually try and get 
back to feeling a bit more normal now. And, you know, I knew the diary was empty now mm. for a little while, even though that was scary because I'd never had to live with sure. that before. <laughs> <And> <laughs> that was far more stressful than running around. Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the controlling side of me didn't like that. But yeah. <laughs> well, I get it. But, uh, or being in control, you know. Um, but when it came to a point, there was a relief of my body was just so happy just to have some time to sort of get back and, and feel nourished. I slept yeah. for ages, as, yeah. as I know you did a lot as well. Well, I think what's, what's really interesting is that, you, you know, we talk about three different stages of recovery and you actually let yourself, I know you were forced initially and ultimately you let yourself though, go into stage one, which is you let yourself have a proper crash. Because mm. some, some people fight that. Mm. Well, I mean, you mm. got to the point, I guess you couldn't fight mm. it anymore. But the body needs to have that time initially of just quality healing and rest. But I think what's really great is, is once you got what you needed, you were able to let yourself have that. Rather okay. than still trying to go back too quickly, you let yourself take that time. I think so, yeah. Initially, that time was there. But slowly, but surely, my mind was catching up. You know, it yeah. was sort of like, you know, well, we sort of need to be looking at, you know, when am I going to come? Uh, and the problem was as well, I was getting all the thoughts of, you know, will I ever play again? You know, will I ever wow. come back from this? Because I heard... That must have been really tough to... Yeah, it was really dark. It was really tough. I mean, I never felt, I mean, you know, in my particular case, I didn't feel low with it. I didn't feel, of course, you feel low spirits, but you no, don't no, feel I depressed. I didn't no, feel I like... There's a big difference between Emmy and depression. They're both real huge. things. They're just different things. Very yeah. different things. And um, so depression, but I did feel um, major anxiety. Yes. Huge anxiety, you know, enough to sort of make me feel worried about going outdoors, you know, or, or sort of... Because my my you know, my sensitivity to stress, I suppose, has mm -hmm. gone so high as, you know, you know, mm -hmm. it goes mm -hmm. to such a point that, you know, you're worried about everything. Of course you're worried because you're thinking, well, this is the love of my life. I love playing the harp. That's what you spent your entire life building up to the pinnacle and then suddenly you, you feel like you, you're falling off it. And, you know, I felt so strongly, you know, from the bottom of my heart that God to play the harp, you know, and <laughs> to sort of, you know, to speak through my music, yeah, really. And, you know, when you feel like that, this thing when it gets taken away yeah. from you because you just think the end of the world has come, you yeah. know. So from that point on, um, I did, you know, a few months in then start to slowly see some signs of, of feeling a little bit stronger in myself. I could actually, you know, I could walk around the house a little mm -hmm. bit then. And um, luckily, my mum found the link then to the clinic. So okay. we'd been thinking, you know, for that first stage, I don't think it quite sunk in. But then we, re you know, we were thinking about what the consultant had said. And um, we looked up online and she found you. And so all of a sudden then things started to make so much sense when I started to listen to the DVDs that you have. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was just summing me up to a complete T. You know, it was, it was all... R reflective of, of what I'd had pretty mm -hmm. much, you know. I mean, I've got to say, my journey has been, of course, shorter than a lot of other people. I mean, I think, you know, there's been so many people, unfortunately, they've had it for so much longer. Sure, sure. But you still feel it the same, and you still feel the same... That's absolutely right. And it's, and it's not a competition, you know. No. It's like a, month, a week, a day is too long to yeah, be going through it. it. And some people, very sadly, can spend decades, and some years and some months, but it's still the same... It may, it may be a very, you know, there's many different versions of ME chronic fatigue in different people. Felt sense is very similar, especially Absolutely. when you when you feel like your life is is being taken away from you in mm. a sense. You started to look at things from the clinic. I know some other things you also looked at as well. Yeah. What what were some of the things that started to make a, a difference for you? What, what what helped you? Well, I think looking at my lifestyle. I think mm -hmm. first of all, you know, looking at what makes sense really and what's kind of a bit more sensible really and acceptable really mm -hmm. to be doing what I thought was normal is really not normal. <laughs> so, you, so you kind of had yeah. a bit of a kind of checking, a kind of yeah. reassessment. Kind yeah, of that, yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I was expecting a lot of myself yeah. and, you know, learning about my personality really, mm -hmm. pointing things out a bit more to me, you know, things I'd taken for granted, you know, the way you think and the way you live your life is what you've always known really. Right. You sort of find a way of being in the world, don't yes. you? And really to have read everything you know it sort of all all of a sudden made a lot of sense and I, I started to, to sort of what bits in my personality mm -hmm. I could maybe just rein in a little bit you know and <laughs> really of, you know just calm it down a little bit you know no need you know Rome wasn't built in a day sort was, of thing and was, was, was that difficult I mean what, what, kind of you know yes. sometimes where <laughs> well yeah because you know sometimes it's like we yes. recognize we have this achiever pattern and we can and we can see that okay it's there, there are ways that it's kind of unhealthy but it's like 
if I don't approach the world like that, then will I not be me or, or will I not be successful? Or, and that can be very, I be very difficult. Yeah, to because it was the only way I'd known. It's right. the only way I'd known to live and to, to sort of progress in my career in that way and as a person to, to sort of develop, mm -hmm. really. So I re you rely on it. It's a default setting. Yeah. And, you know, as the clinic will teach you, you know, it's just all about what's automatic to you at the time. And all of a sudden, wow, actually, there's another way to live. I don't mm. have to be like that. You know, I can actually stop magnifying that side of my life and, and just kind of calm down a little yeah. bit, but approach it in a different way. And yes. so that's exactly what I tried to do really very quickly to try and mm -hmm. rewire things a little bit so mm -hmm. that I would, wouldn't think quite so... Well, so aggressively about things, right. you know, I'd often I'd say, right, that's the goal. I know how to get there. <laughs> so it's just that, you know, and, and then it would happen usually. So you rely on what you know, yeah. really, don't you? Yeah. So it was really useful for me to be able to just, you know, step back yes. from things. And all of a sudden then, um, you know, obviously realizing I needed to get from the stress state down to being in a healing state. And was that something that you found easy or difficult or... Um I would say it took me quite a while to come down. Yeah. I think I'm probably not surprised given you'd spent yes, so many years worrying so yourself many up. Years, yeah. 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 And also living on adrenaline, going from a concert sure. to a concert, you know, it's very draining. So um yeah, so I, I would say a good couple of months to come down from mm -hmm. where I was. Um but my family were really, really supportive in trying to help me to remember you know, to mm -hmm. remind me about these things mm -hmm. and, and to remember and the yoga and the meditation all of a sudden mm -hmm. made a lot of sense. I'll be completely honest, before I thought not for me, really. No, I don't <laughs> think so. I'm not sure about that. But oh my gosh, it doesn't half help. It was amazing. Yeah. It's been so amazing. And even now, if I'm having a bit of a busy day, even if I just, even if it's in the car or whatever it is, I'll just do deep breaths. And yeah. actually, that is enough at the moment to bring me down yes. quite quickly. You know. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like once you've trained your system and you and you've got the kind of skill it becomes so much easier. What takes like months to do is something that, that you can get relatively quickly. Yeah, it seemed like forever so, at the beginning, didn't well, I get it? it. Yeah. I, really, I think it is like forever at, yeah, the, at the beginning. Yeah, it does. And, you know, but I was doing it with the DVD and everything. Sure. And, you know, so, um, but, you know, at that point, as any, everybody will know, you'll do anything to get better, really? just anything and everything. And I tried a lot of different things like Reiki and mm -hmm. uh, lots of different um, methods. But for me in particular, obviously the work with the clinic and looking at a little bit of my nutrition mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. going gluten free, dairy free, that was kind mm -hmm. of quite good yeah. for me just to cleanse my system a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and ease things off my yeah. digestive system. Um, and you're also seeing a chiropractor, you mentioned to me yeah, earlier. Yeah, I've got to say, on the physical side, yeah. I saw a chiropractor in Cardiff, uh, in Cardiff Bay. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, a friend of mine had recommended him to me uh, quite a while before that, actually. Mm -hmm. I just never got around to going to see him. You're too him. busy, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I decided, right, this would be the time, even though it was quite a trek to go to Cardiff. And I thought, yeah. well you know, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of things I've got to get over first to get in the in with and be able to I go I mean, down. that's the thing. It's like when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're that kind of um, affected by any chronic fatigue, just getting to medical appointments is it's, it's a huge stress of its own. Absolutely. That's the thing, you know, that's what's so great about the clinic, really, because you can do it online. And mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. was so much better at the beginning, at that stage. Um, but then a little bit after, about maybe a month or two after I started with the clinic, um, I gained a little bit more strength and um, Chris would take me to the appointments with a chiropractor. And physically that helped me a lot. Um, you know, he realigned my, mm -hmm. my bones in such a way. Which you know, had a bit of a battering over the years. I think, yeah, I did. And my nervous system wasn't functioning properly, as you yes. know, with, with, with ME. You know, that yeah. doesn't quite happen, really. So he, I think, allowed things and tried to invite my body to sort of... To, to heal itself really yes. in that way. And I think I needed that in particular because of all this physical stuff mm -hmm. I was doing. But in general, I would definitely advise that that, that, that was a good move to make yeah. as well because yeah. it's a physical thing. And all of a sudden, I started to feel a bit better as well yes. in myself because, you know, if your body's working properly and if things aren't obstructed, you know, there aren't any blockages in your nervous mm -hmm. system, then, mm -hmm. you know, your brain can get the message through to your body, can't it? Totally. So, totally. so and it I think help. it's great, you know, for everyone, the kind of formula is different, but when you find the pieces that you Jigsaw. need, mm. exactly, and it sounds mm. like 
on the psychology side, really seeing those, that achiever pattern and that helper pattern were pretty fundamental for mm. you. Mm. And then learning to calm your system down. And it sounds like some nutritional work was, was in your case, less important, but also had its Maybe kind of a role. Bit less, yeah. But also the chiropractic side, again, especially given the physicality of, of what you've been Definitely. doing. Definitely. As you were starting to notice that things were improving and you mm. could see that there was kind of, you were getting on the right track, I'm wondering how it was, because often that, that challenge, it's like the initial challenge is learning to really stop and rest and stop fighting to accept where we are. But there's kind of another challenge that starts to come in where we can see we're making progress and then it's like, it's not, I just can't do anything. It's like, I can do some things, but I'm not quite sure how much I can do. Mm. I wonder how that was kind of navigating that stage with that achiever pattern of like, well, maybe I can just start practicing, you know. Yeah. You know the kind of that pressure kind of coming back in I can laugh about it now but gosh it wasn't funny at the time yeah. it was really I mean ugh, yeah I've got I've got images of you strip. kind of going oh I, I can walk around the house right I'll do an hour's practice yeah. kind of thing. So, totally, and, then totally. in, and then in bed for a week afterwards yeah. I wonder if I'm right or not but that, that kind of sense yeah. of too quickly wanting to come back I, I did yeah and I and I think I probably did come back a little bit quickly um I'm a little bit impatient really? generally <laughs> I hadn't got that from what you said so far <laughs> but I'm working on it I'm working on it but uh, but that's just I don't know it's just the the way I'm built I guess but I mean um but I guess you also had you learned to listen in yeah. a sense yeah because you had no choice it. that was the key all of a sudden the penny dropped and you mm-hmm. know the key was listening to my body and um I did actually do it gradually at the beginning because mm-hmm. I didn't go back to playing the harp straight away because and I know if I went there and sat for long hours then I'd obviously go backwards so yes. um and I desperately that but there how was a long, how long was the period of time that you, that you weren't really playing for <sighs> probably a good few months yeah. and that's a long time in a musician's no, life no, because y- you know you forever you yeah. know when you're playing every day sure. um you know it was it was just too much to be able to hold my arms up I was just too tired around my shoulders yeah. and um and how long from so doing concerts and kind of performing you? so I remember going back to doing, there was a couple of really quite high profile concerts Mm -hmm. I'd committed to about a year before. Mm -hmm. Um, And they were probably one of the biggest ones I really just really Mm -hmm. wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I figured out, you know, there were were quite a few I wasn't able to do obviously over that time. But when it got to maybe about month five, maybe Mm -hmm. or something like that, um, there was a couple of really high profile ones and I felt I think it'll upset me more not to do I it. And I thought, okay, I think I'm going to commit to doing it and I'm mm-hmm. going to go through with it. But I'd given myself then all the support that I needed. Obviously, my family were all there. I made sure, of course, I had to rely on painkillers, which was mm-hmm. awful mm-hmm. and horrible, But and they had horrible side effects. Sure. I felt very dizzy and stuff sure. and, and sick and things. But I think it would have destroyed me more no, not to it. do it at the I time because I just felt I really wanted to do it and it was a big thing. Um, I remember doing that a couple of concerts and I just remember coming off stage and just crying my eyes off for about two hours because I was so exhausted yeah. I'd been on stage people didn't have a clue didn't yeah, know you know and I was trying to smile and keep it yeah. all together you know which of course you do but also more than that you know going back to playing your instrument and there was an orchestra accompanying me and there w- it was live on tv you know there was a lot of different things like that and going also on. I imagine the the, the, the the pain of the thing that you love so much and not being able to just be free to do it but yeah. kind of this kind of black cloud kind of hanging around it absolutely and although I know you've come to see it differently subsequently but at, but at that time yeah and not knowing how long it would last yeah. you know not knowing how how badly I'd be like you know but I could see slight improvements you know coming yes. along and that really encouraged me but then of course came the the period of the tired and wired and you know kind of and also the trial and error you yeah. know when it came to you know bouncing the boundaries really yeah. and trying to find where my limit was and oh my gosh that that stage felt like a long stage yeah. even though I know you know compared to a lot of people I suppose it was shorter but I mean it was about at least a year yeah and, um, that, and that stage I think sometimes is more difficult than the kind of crash stage because in the crash stage the, the the focus is simply you have the rest and okay that's that's super challenging yes but in the kind of stage where you're kind of coming through tired and wired towards re- what we call the reintegration stage it's like there's you think you can do something you do it and you crash and it's like there's that building of expectation and the disappointment that that's just very difficult to live with yeah. I think, in and the, the frustration yeah. the frustration as well which then you realize actually that will make things worse if you get <laughs> sure. frustrated with yourself <laughs> because then you get frustrated at yourself <laughs> yeah. for getting frustrated at yourself which is even more frustrating <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. So there's all these things going on, and particularly with concerts, it's not the type of thing you can kind of take it easy, really. Right, and and the it. type of I things that I do usually are kind of about an hour and a half long mm. of playing 245s. But it's you also know. all the rehearsals leading up to it mm. as well. So it's quite a demanding mm -hmm. thing. So it was a job to know when was the right time. But mm -hmm. also, I didn't really want to stay away from the stage too long because I was worried I would lose confidence. And, yes. you know, obviously from a personal point of view, uh, yeah, I, I felt if I stayed off, will I get back on? No, I get it. You know, so it. it was a real big kind of learning curve. And I thought, will I ever get out to this? Because there were times where, you know, in that stage where, you know, I'd get to the end of a concert and I'd be exhausted. I'd be so tired. I remember there was one up in the north and Chris had to literally carry me home, mm -hmm. literally, you know, hold me. I couldn't walk because I was just too tired. I, I just couldn't give it any and talking to people was difficult mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I felt it was giving, I was getting exhausted by it. You know? the, that's the biggest thing I love to do is to speak to my audience, you yeah. know. So, and then, so, you know, there came points where there was a lot of things like panic attacks and things mm -hmm. that would happen. Mm -hmm. I, I'd really panic about it and anxiety was... And, and I should big. say, I think probably not because you're someone that, that historically had a background with anxiety, but it's just partly the nervous system is so kind of fragile in that mm. state that you almost get biological anxiety. That yeah. You probably know what yeah, I mean yeah, by yeah, that. It's I like yeah. you're kind of like, yeah. why am I anxious? But there's just, there's no real energy. So you're pump, mm. your body's pumping adrenaline to compensate To for just that. get you through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there'd be days where I felt a bit better and I feel like mm. I've got some energy. That's great. I can, I can do it. And then, of course, you get carried away with it. And, <laughs> sure. and then you empty the tank. And yeah. then, you know, and, and you can, you know, there'd be times, you know, at the beginning, at, at that stage, sometimes it was maybe a week I'd be washed out for or two weeks or whatever yes. it was and then the, that time would slowly slowly I'd begin to be winning then in the end because I was listening to my body if I felt any pain mm -hmm. if I felt anything at all that wasn't right in my body I would stop even yes. if I was in the middle of rehearsing or anything and that I must have stop. taken a huge amount of discipline and, and, and yeah. I guess is the demonstration of the change that had happened that you that you were valuing your body and your health more than this achiever kind of helper yeah, kind of pattern I was. that was going on. My attitude changed completely. Yeah. I was such a go-getter before, and not that I'm not now. I still am, but I mean, but in a very different way. And you understand like, you have to take care of yourself as well yeah. as everyone else. And I've yeah. realised if I'm not, if my health and me are not first in life. Yeah. Everything else doesn't matter anyway. I'm not right. going to have anything else. Because it's not sustainable without yeah, it. Yeah, because I was so blinkered. I wasn't really thinking. And also, it changed me completely. You know, I, I've realized there's more important things as well. I love that side of my life. Yeah. But well, I was going to ask you about that. You know, when, when you, as you've kind of coming through the other side and you look back on, you know, your life as a teenager in your 20s and this whole journey that you've kind of gone through. And then, of course, those kind of few years, particularly with Emmy chronic fatigue. How do you see that now? Because, of course, at the time, I'm sure it was the worst thing that could have happened. I imagine it was mm. awful. But I know that you have a different perspective on it now. And I think it's really think inspiring people to hear about that. Well, I think it's probably, in a funny sort of way, the best thing that ever happened to me, really, even though it was an awful time in my mm. life, and as it is for so many people. But actually, it really woke me up, and it really, really made me realize, actually, what is the most important thing in life and, um, and what makes me happy really. Mm -hmm. What actually makes me happy? Is it having a back-to-back -back schedule? Does that mean that I'm successful just because mm -hmm. I've got a back-to-back -back mm -hmm. schedule? No, it doesn't. It just, what, what I do within my career can be paced and it mm -hmm. can be at a, at a pace that I can cope with, really. And I'm yeah. in control. I don't have to allow things to overtake me, really. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fortunately, at this point, I can now, you know, choose to say yes or no to things and not that I'm saying I couldn't before but when you, you know you do well, tend to you, at the well, beginning you, you could in principle but I think yeah. for you you just felt you had to you had to keep pushing yeah yourself. exactly and uh, I myself completely through through doing that you know so um so I'm pleased to say you know I've I of course it's it's always a journey I think I, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the type it's of a, it's thing a good, it's a good name for an album that isn't it well isn't it <laughs> 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 Funnily enough, well, that's why I called the album Journeys because, you know, I've produced albums before that have been, you know, important and, and have, have done fa and done okay, you know, uh, in different ways. But, I mean, um, this particular one has just been so personal, mm. really, because throughout my journey, okay, the yoga and the meditation and different things would help. But for me particularly, I listened to so much music yes. when I was 
ill because of obviously right, that's sure my passion. That speaks to you, yeah. And there were lots of different pieces I noticed that had different effects on my health. You know, mm -hmm. if I listen to something quite calm, quite quite slow, quite tuneful, mm -hmm. it would really just chill me out and just make me think, yeah, okay, I can sleep to this or I can relax. And if I listen to something quite, you know, I don't know, minor or something quite really, you know, fast paced, mm. I, I would maybe stress out a little bit more, sure, you know, sure. and it was really weird to see that happen, yeah. but it does work, you know, if you do listen to something that's a bit more appropriate for your stage. Uh, and so I thought, well, why don't I just record those bits that I thought were important to yeah. me? So I picked out all the songs that I felt were, were really, you know, imperative and, and important to me. And um, so there's two or three, like Ladies in Lavender and, um, you know, Go to Sleep My Baby, which is a really famous Welsh song. Scarborough Fair is on mm -hmm. there, but mm -hmm. it, with a new twist. Um, and then that rep represents that first stage of being ill, uh -huh. not being able to do anything. Uh -huh. And then there's the latter stage, which is me now, which I'm a lot more full of life mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. vitality mm -hmm. now. And things like Toss the Feathers is mm -hmm. in there, which is very lively as well. I had the Linda Mozart players accompanying me on it. And... Mm -hmm. um, Chris, my husband, was a big, big part of it as well because yeah. he's a composer and an arranger. And so he's arranged all of the album. He also arranged the harp that we did before the, the, the last album. And, uh, and, and he also composed a piece. He did, yeah. Well, yeah. And that's actually quite a nice story because it's called Bluestone. And um, I don't know if many of your viewers might know this, but um, uh, there's, in Pembrokeshire, there's a very, very famous collection of stones, Bluestone. Mm -hmm. And it's very near to where I was born, literally within about two miles. There are some Bluestone um, there. I was there actually last week. And uh, these stones were taken to Stonehenge to form, form Stonehenge mm. and the myth is that they're very very magical and they actually could be healing stones so when I was starting to feel slightly better maybe a few min months into the crash uh, we call it the crash um, Chris would take me you know I just about I'd, he'd put me in the car and he would take me for a little spin up behind my parents house in Pembrokeshire mm -hmm. to see the Prasali mountains and it's a View, gorgeous mm -hmm. view and then there's the blue stones which are there you know so um and we just talked about how you know the history of the stones and things and thought well how amazing would it be just to just come i told him like compose a piece about it you know <laughs> i'd love to have a piece that i could play about it so uh so it was lovely that he did that and so we've recorded it and did a video of it and you yeah. could see it all on 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 all the various social networks yeah, yeah. you know on facebook and on the website yeah you know? and we'll get that out in a minute yeah 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 so and, and i also i just maybe as, as we kind of begin to come to the close that uh, um, David, our chairman, and I were, were lucky enough to be invited down to the recording of part of the album, which I have to say was a very cool experience. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> but it was really fascinating as well, seeing you take care of, be, being back in your kind of, kind of world of, of kind of work, but integrating what you've learned through the time you've been ill. You know, seeing you, you know, your family supporting you, and also you mentioned you had, before um, on a camera, had a, a masseuse come down, and you were doing bits of meditation and yoga. So... Just tell us a little bit about yeah. that kind of integration, you know, and, and yeah. how you see yourself approaching life, because kind of, you know, life is a, is a journey, you know, and of course, yeah. you know, I know you've come a, a long way in having recovered, and of course, life continues and the pressures start to mount again, and how you see yourself really honouring what you learned. In the time that you were yeah, around. I think you learn through the feelings and what you experience with these techniques. The tools that you learn through the clinic and through various different things like yoga and meditation, mm. I think that feeling sticks with you. The feeling of feeling, oh, actually, I feel quite good today now mm. after that. And I feel quite well again. I think there's nothing more powerful than just feeling it and experiencing it. So um, through having done that quite a few times and sort of, put my toolkit together, you know, and mm -hmm. worked out mm -hmm. what works mm -hmm. for me quite well. Um, the, the hardest task then is to be disciplined and use it every day. Yeah. And as you know... But especially you know, when you haven't got the call of symptoms to be the thing to get you to do it. Precisely. Like initially, when we still have symptoms, we're much more mindful. And then... Maybe I am superhuman again. <laughs> that's where it kind of takes, more, yeah. takes more discipline than, yeah, than, than, than it does before that. Absolutely. So that's what I found challenging, was just making sure I make time in the day to yes. put these things into action because to put, it to quickly, put you first yeah, yeah and it quickly catches up with you if you don't so I've I've already gone through that yeah. bit and so when it came to um, I actually debated whether I would be able to record it's quite a it's a really 
experience. Yeah. And you know, someone like me will put like pressure on yourself to kind of be pretty good when you get to that stage. I want it to be good enough to live with really yeah. for the rest of my life. And it's, it, I take it really seriously. And so, um, but there was nothing better. I, I don't regret any of it. It was such an amazing time to get back together with the same team of people that recorded my last album. And, um, but we approached it differently, as you said. I put things in place, um, like, you know, somebody to come and give me a little bit of TLC in the middle, you know, mm. massage my body, because it's such a physical experience. Sure, I had sure. to sit by the harp for, I think, nine hours, I think, was the first day, which is huge compared to where sure, I've come from. Sure. And I knew I was putting my body through it, you know. Um, so I can't do that every day now, don't, don't get me wrong. I don't sit <laughs> there for Not many people can, right? No, absolutely <laughs> not. It's just the nature of recording. You have yeah. to do it within a certain sure, time. And also, you know, preparing myself mentally for it was the other thing because there's a huge amount of concentration, as you can imagine, to mm -hmm. redo things all the time. You need about four or five takes of the same piece, you know. So it's quite challenging. So I think I felt like I got on top of the recording. I before but mm -hmm. that was the other thing my body remembered what it was like before to do it and it's quite a stressful experience yeah. and I find myself talking about the recording and I get quite stressed yeah. so um, that was the other thing to sort of let my body know that was in the past and this and, was a new and experience you're different and it's different now. yeah and yeah. it's going to be fine and yeah. it will be fine and you know it's just reiterating giving myself the positive sort of yeah. chat in the shower every morning <laughs> <laughs> a little pep talk yourself <laughs> that's my place that i would check in with myself yeah. most of the time you know and uh, so um when it came to things like the photo shoot then and different things like that that was a different ask for my body yes. you know things uh, you know cropped up that I didn't expect to feel really yeah. tiredness and different things um so you know you still go through these little things but it's not obviously anywhere near where where it was yeah. there you know I'm fully recovered now but I obviously use the tools a lot to get yeah. me through and you're having to face being a human being rather than a superhuman being which absolutely. Yeah, comes with its own challenges absolutely. doesn't it absolutely <laughs> I completely agree but you know I'm, I'm still asking quite a lot of myself this year there's quite a lot of things going on not just the release of the album but we've got some tours in China and in America mm -hmm. later on in the year um, and where the album will be released yeah. as well. Um, but, you know, I've, I've done it in a far more sensible way this time. There is time after I get yeah. back to get over the trip, yeah. um, and I've scheduled in enough breaks uh, that there's time for me just to have some downtime really yes. in between. And uh, I just think that's the biggest piece of, of advice, really, yeah. is to just listen to your body and, you know... You just it asked, all answering my last question, which was that what would you, to, to that you that was maybe just, you know, had that seizure and just kind of coming, coming into the what was the beginnings of this journey, yeah. what, what, what you would say to that, that you? I think the first thing I'd say is put yourself first. Mm. Definitely, you have to listen to your body and put yourself first. And secondly, is be very aware. Just be mm. very aware of thoughts that are running you know and and your beliefs and your your attitude and your your thinking of life really uh, the, the way you're you're wired as such you know um obviously it's been very clear the way I've sure. <laughs> gone about it but um you know I wouldn't have it any other way I mean I, I'm not regretting anything I mean at the end of the day I, some amazing things have happened and I'm really truly grateful for that and I could never change anything in that way but I'm now looking at things with a, with clear vision sure. and thinking this is a new chapter and yeah. I've now completely started from afresh and yeah. it's up to me now how right. life goes from now on and it's up to me to decide and make those choices where I need to to make yes. things you know as easy as possible for me to be able to carry out a long and sustainable career yeah right. beautiful Beautiful. So if people want to find out more, they can go to clairejones.co.uk. Yeah. And I know on there you've got what kind of concerts. People can find out how to order the album through the various different yeah. kind of places. Yeah, and it's worth saying as well, if you just sign up on the website, you can get a free download of a track that's on there because it's on pre-order at the moment <laughs> and it comes out on Sunday. But if you do feel, you know, just about well enough to come to the concert, uh, it's on March the 5th yeah. in St. John's Smith Square. Yeah. 
uh, and I'll be playing five tracks from the new album, Journey, and then I'll also be doing the Mozart Flute and Harp Concerto. So uh, it'll be a balanced programme, and the proceeds will be going towards the Optimum Health Clinic. So Which we, we hugely appreciate. And I, well, I should say that if people do come down as well, we'd also love to see them, because a bunch of us obviously coming down as well. And we're, we're really well, I've got to say as well, I must thank the clinic from the bottom of my heart. You've been amazing, and you know I couldn't have got there without you, really. And so it's just really important that everybody who listens, you know, just sticks with it and mm. just believe in it and, and keep listening to everything you have to say because it really, really does work. Thanks, Claire. I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Great. And thank you for your time as well. I know Pleasure. you're super busy with somewhat more high profile <laughs> press. So I really Not appreciate you coming <laughs> down and making the time to talk with us. I really do. So thank you. Pleasure. Great. Thanks thank a lot. You. And thank you everyone for watching. If you want to find out more about the Optum Health Clinic, you can go to freedomfrommme.co.uk. And also, if you enjoyed this interview, there's, there's many other different recovery stories at secretstorecovery.com. But thank you, Claire, and thank you for watching. And we look forward to talking with you again, hopefully, very soon. Bye-bye.